Good morning. Welcome to CADEX TV. My name is Frank Fortunato. This is a live broadcast. Today is February 28th, Thursday, 2008. It's 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time in the U.S., 4.30 p.m. in London, 12.30 in Bermuda, and in Mexico City, it's 10.30 in the morning. If you need to contact us during the broadcast, you can phone in toll-free at 1-866-67-CADEX. Our instant mail address is CADEX TV on AOL. Today's day in history, today in 1975, a tube train, one of the London subway trains, ran into a wall at the end of a tunnel, killing 40 people. Also in 1953, DNA was discovered by doctors Crick and Watson in Cambridge University. Now we'll go to our main story. This is the story that has been on the wires. We have Rod Fox here on hold. He's going to be speaking with us a little bit about it. Guy Carpenter has suddenly replaced his chief executive, David Spiller, replacing him with Peter Zafino, who's currently, or was currently, the firm's head of U.S. treaty operations. It was an unexpected move. The reinsurance broker also confirmed that Britt Newhouse would become chairman of Carpenter. This is the latest major management overhaul at the Marsh McLennan companies following the arrival of Brian Dupereau several weeks ago as group CEO. And it seems to indicate his determination to drive change at the organization. Earlier this month, <coughs> excuse me, Marsh UK announced it was parting company with three senior members of its management team. Newhouse is named chairman. Both appointments are effective immediately. Both Zafino and Newhouse will report directly to Dupereau. Dupereau said in Peter and Britt, we have a wealth of reinsurance industry and experience. Zafino joined Carpenter in 2001. Prior to his current role as EVP and head of U.S. Treaty, he was responsible for treaty operations at Carpenter's U.S. Eastern Region. Newhouse had joined Carpenter all the way back in 79 in the firm's New York Casualty Treaty Department, and he's currently president of the America's Broking Operation and as a member of the firm's executive committee. Rob Fox is on the phone with us today. Fox had previously been, if I can remember all this, the CEO of Benfield, um, while actually Benfield Group in the United States. Prior to that, he had been the CEO of E.W. Blanche in the United States. And now if, and he had an interim stop as the CEO of Praetorian Group, which was a reinsurer, and now is the CEO of a Bermuda-based um, managing general underwriter called New Asset Class. Rod, are you with us on the phone there? I am here, Frank. Very good. Thank you for taking time to talk with us today. I, I'm, I thought to reach out to you because I can think of very few people who have had experience on both sides of the Atlantic in reinsurance broking on an international scale. What do you make of today's developments? Well, I, it's interesting. I, uh, I heard about it yesterday afternoon. I got a phone call from somebody, and about a minute later, I, I saw a copy of the internal memo at, uh, at Guy Carpenter. Uh, as you know, as you said, David and I worked closely together at the Benfield Group. He was running the international operation. I was running the U.S. I consider him a good friend. I think David made some great strides at, uh, at Carpenter. As you know, there's a lot going on at the MMC Group, uh, a lot of changes lately, not necessarily Carpenter, but at the MMC level, uh, Marsh Inc., the, the brokerage operation. Uh, my sense is Brian Dubrow is coming in and, and taking charge and putting his stamp on it and, uh, and shaking the organization up a little bit. I did speak with David personally this morning at his house in London, uh, he was in great spirits. Uh, David is living in the UK, and I think you know, for various reasons uh, needs to live in the UK. Uh, Brian wants to have a New York centralized leadership operation, and some changes were made. Uh, David seems uh, very comfortable with it. Um, you know, the Zafino legacy at, at Carpenter continues. Uh, the Newhouse legacy, uh, so probably, you know, good all the way around. What, uh, what can you say about Newhouse? He's a talented guy. He's, uh, as you said, he's been there for a long time. Um, I know his father well. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, he's been there for a long time. Uh, he's got a lot of experience. Uh, he's a great guy. Uh, I think he's a great guy. Uh, 
uh, you know, knows the organization well. My sense with uh, a, a carpenter organization, like any large company like that, it's a little tricky sometimes to bring in somebody from the outside. I'm not sure how all the politics work, but the spillers seem to be effective. But at the end of the day, Marsh and Carpenter are, are New York-based groups, and I think you got to be there. Well, I certainly am one of the last people to uh, ask questions about working with your father, but isn't it true that Peter Zafino's father, Sal Zafino, ran Carpenter for a number of years? He did. He did. And, uh, and Sal did a great job. I mean, I competed against him uh, for years, and uh, you know, he, he did a nice job energizing that organization. I know Peter. I don't know him extremely well. analogy with today the 55th anniversary of the discovery of DNA to use. Let me ask you a question. Uh, many people uh, are wondering what you're doing. Can you give us a little update as to your activities recently? Sure. Um, I started a, uh, and I listened to your introduction, I'll, I'll give you the, my version of it. Um, I started a partnership with a guy named Jim Standard. Yes, well known. Fairly well. Um, founder of Renaissance Re. Ten years in a row, a leader in return on equity in the entire insurance business. Um, I've known Jim forever, and we started an investment holding company, FMS, uh, the fancy there, Fox and Tanner. And the first thing we did is we formed a managing general underwriter for a new asset class. Um, we believe the world is changing, and that there are all sorts of organizations um, that want to touch and, and, and be a part of the insurance sector, hedge funds, banks, etc. And we wanted something that could play both to the traditional old money insurance business, which is not going anywhere. I mean, the world's not changing overnight, but also be able to play to some of the new players. New asset class on a significant stake of an uh, MGA called Insight Group. Mm -hmm. by two gentlemen that uh, you and I know extremely well, Andy DiLoretto and Terry McLean. Uh, they are focused in the property tech insurance space, doing very well with some very high-tech tools. And then we will build out different classes of risk within their asset class. So that was step one. And then very recently, we haven't even announced it yet. We'll probably announce it very shortly. Jim and I also started a reinsurance broker called Alpha Re. And it's, it's timely that we're talking about David Spiller and Guy Carpenter. We believe there's a lot of fragmentation, dislocation going on in the reinsurance brokerage marketplace. And we think there's a place for a really high-end, sophisticated, private boutique reinsurance broker. And that's what we're going to build. And emphasis on private because having spent a lot of time in the reinsurance brokerage business at both public and private companies, the key is talent, and we believe we can build a great bench of talent with an attractive private company. Well, there certainly are merits uh, on both sides between the private and the, and the public, and you certainly would be uh, experienced in both sides. Let me ask you, uh, when you refer to that bench, are there any uh, players on that bench you'd care to name? Well, we've got nine people working for us already. Uh, we've, uh, we've been fortunate, picked up some business. Um, we formed a partnership with the uh, BMS group, Valentine McKee and Sullivan, mm -hmm. whereby they, they are providing uh, London broke-in uh, in Lloyd's, as well as all backroom services, contract rating, accounting claims. So we're a 
business instantly. Um, and uh, a gentleman by the name of Ted Blanche, who I think you, you know well. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Larry Lemire, probably not as well known to you, who helped build the back room for me at Benfield, and also prior to that at Blanche, has joined us. Um, a broker by the name of Mark Larstella. Uh, and you know, we'll be adding from there. And uh, you know, without even announcing it, we've already had a lot of interest, uh, both from prospective clients as well as prospective employees. So we intend to, in, intend to build a, a really high class uh, reinsurance brokerage operation. And this uh, entity will sit under that uh, investment vehicle you formed with Jim Stenard, right? Okay. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a one-stop shopping uh, for anything related to risk. The next thing you'll be putting is a modeling company in there, I bet. Yeah, you know, you never know. You never know. Yeah. Well, it's good to see the return of Ted Blanche anyway, that's for sure. Well, you know, it's great. It's great for me, uh, Frank. I mean, you, you know Ted. You've known both of us for a long time. Uh, he is so excited. It's just great to watch. He's turned on. He's flying around the country. He's got 40 years of experience. Uh, he's still got a lot of energy. And uh, it's funny, Jim Standard was commenting to me. Jim um, is just so excited about you know, having Ted involved and, and what Ted brings from an experience and a relationship perspective. So it's been great. It's really exciting. Well, very good, Rod. Listen, uh, you have our best of luck, and uh, you, whether or not you know it or not, you just did announce the formation of Alpha Re. We have uh, several hundred viewers around the world, so uh, the news is out there. We appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Thank you. Well, well thank you, and I uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Gotcha. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. All, right. Bye. All right. In other news, Swiss Re, finally some other shoes are beginning to drop here now. Swiss Re has been hit by a class action lawsuit over the collateralized mortgage obligation write-downs. U.S. lawyers have brought the suit against Swiss Re in connection with last November's 1.2 billion franc Swiss franc write-down of two credit default swap contracts. The New York law firm of Coughlin, Stoya, Jella, Rudman, and Robbins said it had filed the suit in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York. That's the big banana alleging the reinsurer had made false and misleading statements about his financial condition. The action has been brought on behalf of an unnamed institutional investor, and the law firm states that it may be joined by any U.S. resident who purchased Swiss Re shares between May 8th and November 19th of 2007. It alleges that the Swiss giant had failed to disclose that Swiss Re's credit solutions unit had written two credit default swaps that exposed the company to great financial risk. I'm sure we'll be seeing a number of those suits. Now to our casualty report. A gas explosion in Lyon, France has killed at least one person and injured 26 others this morning in the southeastern city. Roadworks set off the midday, blanch, uh, midday blast, excuse me, according to authorities. The blast caused a fire in a nearby building. A fireman was amongst one of the injured. In Bangladesh, a ferry carrying more than 100 people capsized in a river near the Bangladeshi capital of Dhaka this morning, killing at least 17 people. Rescuers recovered 20 bodies after the ferry sank, so it must be up to 20 by now, in the Burganga River near the capital. The death toll could rise because many passengers are feared trapped inside the boat. The ferry shown here is the MV Saurav, S-A-U-R-A-V and was traveling from Dhaka to the, private, the nearby town of Taltala. Private TV station NTV has put the death toll as high as 27. And in California, near Los Angeles last night, a small plane crashed into a residential neighborhood in Riverside, California, killing three people in a fiery impact that destroyed a car and engulfed palm trees in flames. No one on the ground was hurt. Witnesses thought that the plane started having trouble soon after taking off from Riverside Municipal Airport, about half a mile away from the crash site. It was unclear if the pilot was trying to return to the airport. At the time of the crash, a homeowner said he was outside his home when he saw the plane coming toward him. He said the plane veered, then nosedived onto the street. Quote, I knew he wasn't going to make it. It blew up and all the trees caught fire. 
At least 16 people have been killed in Gujarat, India by a high-speed train in the western Indian state. The victims, some of the men and women, are walking along the sides of the track when they were crushed under the wheels. They're said to be migrant laborers from the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. It's not immediately clear why they were walking on the tracks. The railway police said the accident took place yesterday near the city of Surat in Gujarat. They said that the bodies of the victims who had disembarked at Surat and were walking along the rail tracks were apparently spotted by the engineer of another train. Poor safety measures and unmanned rail crossings are the cause of frequent rail accidents in India, where more than 13 million people travel on the state-run railways every day. And in Greece, it's becoming like Indonesia again, another earthquake. This one with a preliminary magnitude of 5.0 rattled southern Greece this morning. No injuries or damage were reported. The quake hit at 6.54 a.m. local time, again in the same area, off the southern city of Kalamata, about 175 mi miles southwest of Athens. You see the orange here on the USGS map. That's the quake this morning. Behind it, you can see a yellow. That's the quake from three days ago. And behind that yellow, you can see another orange. That's the quake from the day before yesterday. Greece has now been jolted in the southern area by more than a dozen earthquakes since the beginning of the year. And how apropos this is, considering the Democratic presidential candidates are arguing about striking in the tribal regions of Pakistan, at least 12 people have been killed in what seems to be a missile strike in South Waziristan in the tribal region of Pakistan bordering Afghanistan. The missile hit a house, killing suspected Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters. The attack took place near a village called Kalusha, according to an intelligence official. Most of the dead are of Arab origin. Pakistani's tribal regions close to the Afghan border are seen as strongholds of Al-Qaeda resistance. A security official said that he believed that a missile was fired by a U.S. drone. The house was hit. It was belonged to a Pashtun tribesman with no links to Al-Qaeda. The U.S. military have fired missiles on the Pakistani side of the border several times in recent years, most recently last month when one of Osama bin Laden's top lieutenants, Abu al-Libi, was killed. Nobody is confirming this yet, so we'll have to wait and see. And now we'll break for a word from our sponsors and come back with the rest of the news. Every day, the world wakes up and goes to work, pursuing the unique opportunities that lead the global economy forward. The complexity and close connectivity of today's global marketplace is a true modern miracle that can create unparalleled success. But it takes confidence, passion, innovation, and understanding. Enabling opportunity. Protecting capital. Engineering innovation. Investing in your future. Ensuring continuity. Finding the right balance. It takes Aeon. From prehistoric time to today, man's progress has been marked by his ability to fashion tools and use them to his advantage. From early humans making tools from stone, man evolved and was soon trading with other men. Money evolved and tools such as the abacus to handle complex money transactions were developed. By the end of the 19th century, machines such as the cash register began to appear. A hundred years later, we have even better computer-driven machines which track stock, change prices and automatically reorder. Meanwhile, the reinsurance industry has failed to embrace man's drive for progress. The reinsurance industry today would be as familiar to practitioners from the 1800s as it is to modern underwriters. An underwriter or broker from 1800 would settle nicely into today's business. That is, until now. For the reinsurance industry, Pivot Point changes everything. Soon it will be understood that the period before Pivot Point was as dark as the caveman period was before the abacus. Come and see for yourself if you don't believe. After a demonstration, you will understand what is possible. As you know, yesterday there was an earthquake in Great Britain. It was the largest earthquake the country had felt for 25 years. 
It was a magnitude 5.2 quake. It originated from an uncharted crack in the Earth's crust three miles below Lincolnshire, about four minutes before 1 a.m. yesterday morning. People in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, Yorkshire, the Midlands, Norfolk, London, Brighton, and South Wales felt the tremor, which displaced chimney pots and dislodged roof tiles. One man in Birmingham was taken to the hospital with a broken pelvis after the chimney crashed through the roof of his house and landed on him. The damage to homes and properties is now expected to amount to more than 10 million pounds, which would be over 20 million U.S., this according to the Association of British Insurers yesterday. According to a senior seismologist at the British Geological Survey, another earthquake of similar size might strike again in the next few weeks. He went on to say there are lots of pre-existing fault lines in the UK, which is why we have these earthquakes. They are random and they happen all over the country. He went on to say as well, looking at the pattern, if someone asked me where there was a good chance where one would happen next, I would say in North Wales or Northwest Scotland, but they're completely random. The area worst affected yesterday appeared to be Grimsby in the northeast of Lincolnshire. Police said that their force had received dozens of calls from residents, but there are no reports of injuries. Homeowners apparently should be covered for any damage caused by yesterday's quake. Earthquakes are considered a standard peril in UK homeowners policies, as are storms and floods, and any structural damage to a property would be included in a standard buildings policy. However, damage to objects within the home would be covered only by a contents policy. Norwich Union, the UK's largest general insurer, said early yesterday, we have seen claims coming into our call centers overnight, but we expect further calls today as damage will become more obvious in the daylight. Royal Sun Alliance said that it had already received about 100 claims so far, mostly related to damaged roofs and slates. Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General appears to have pulled a coup off in news that came out just about two hours ago. He announced that rival leaders in Kenya have agreed to form a coalition government, this after weeks of violence and political unrest. Anand has been mediating talks between the government and the opposition, and he said a couple of hours ago that an agreement had been made ending the political crisis. He said, we have come to an understanding on the coalition government. We have an agreement. He said that further information on the deal between Moai Kabaki, the president, and Raila Odinga, the leader of the opposition party, would be given later today. You may recall that the crisis ignited after a disputed presidential election at the end of December in which the opposition party claimed was rigged. More than 1,500 people have been killed in the rioting and tribal clashes which followed. The Insurance Day newspaper is reporting that the 2008 Global Catastrophe Loss Bill looks like it will rise again. This amid fears that the recent storms in China could cause insured losses exceeding $1.2 billion. As well, recent mining losses in Australia are also feared to have resulted in an industry cost exceeding the initial estimates, this apparently due to the large sum of insured minerals being purchased by China that are in the region. The sudden surge in insured losses impacting the region has sparked calls for a regional CAT model for the Asia-Pacific region. Right now, incredibly enough, only country-by-country -country models are available. Modeling limitations are apparently due to many factors, including lack of historical data, as well as an absence of models for some perils. The Regional Managing Director for Asia for score reinsurance, Benedict Ho, says that the recent storm in China could be the most important loss in the history of the country, with insured losses probably ending up at 1.2 billion U.S. He warned of the possible market impact of a super typhoon on a path that hits Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, and said currently that this is a scenario that they don't have enough data to model. That would be a tough one to imagine, a Hurricane Andrew sweeping through those three locations. And we're going to hold before we bring this picture up, if we could. This is uh, the last story, and as you know, the last story is generally not related to reinsurance or world events. And this really falls under one that uh, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, this comes from Maine, which is a state in the northeastern uh, United States. Jonathan McCollum, a college student, was in perfect health at 155 pounds when he left to spend the school year as an exchange student in Egypt. You can bring it up now.
But when he returned home to Maine just four months later, the five foot nine inch teenager weighed a mere 97 pounds and was so weak that he struggled to carry his baggage or climb a flight of stairs. McCollum said he was denied sufficient food while staying with a family of Coptic Christians in, in Egypt who apparently, according to him, fast for more than 200 days a year in a regimen unmatched by other Christians. But he does not view the experience as a culture clash. Rather, he's claiming it reflected mean and stingy treatment by his host family, whose broken English made it difficult to communicate with. Friends and teachers at this English-speaking school in Egypt urged him to change his host family, but he stayed put. After returning to the U.S., he was hospitalized for nearly two weeks. The 17-year-old has regained about 20 pounds, <clears throat> excuse me, but his parents say he's not the same boy that left. They say that he was outgoing, a straight-A student, now he's sp less spontaneous and more subdued. McCollum's parents said that the exchange program should have warned them that students placed with Coptic families would be subject to dietary restrictions. There's been no response from the exchange program. They referred calls to their attorney. Now this story gets interesting. The host father, a gentleman named Shaker Hana, who is apparently a Coptic Christian in Egypt, rejected McCollum's story as a lie, quote, suggesting that McCollum made it up because his parents were hoping to recover some of the money they paid for his stay as compensation. Mr. Hana said, quote, the truth is, the boy we hosted for nearly six months was eating for an hour and a half at every meal. The amount of food he ate at each meal was equal to six people. He added that the boy was active, constantly exercising, and playing sports. Hanna said his family went out of its way to prepare special foods, including fish and chicken for McCollum during the fast period. McCollum disputes this and said he wasn't fed enough. McCollum still did not complain to his parents. McCollum's father suspects that his son may have fallen victim to Stockholm Syndrome, in which people start to feel a sense of loyalty to those who victimize them. McCollum's parents first sensed something was amiss shortly before Christmas when they got an email from his counselor saying that Jonathan really, really needs to go home. But they did not act. I don't know. McCollum, however, has not lost his enthusiasm for international travel. In fact, he's already planning his next trip. He's going to hike for uh, three weeks in Zimbabwe and build homes there as part of a charity program. Good for him. Hopefully he'll bring his own food. Well, if we have any other news, <laughs> maybe we'll interview McCollum next. If we have any other news, we'll come back and tell you. If not, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for watching.